Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. Before I start talking, I would really like to hear from you first. If you had, these are some of my favorite quotes that are up here right now. If you guys had anything that you, just one sentence that comes to mind, anybody want to share that with me? Just your impression of the whole movie, for especially people who haven't seen it before. I thought about putting that up here. I decided not to. Probably should have. Well, so let me talk a little bit about um, not the science, which I guess I'm supposed to talk about next. I'm an aerospace engineer, and I also have computer science background. But just a little more about the movie. Um, first of all, just a little more about me. Um, I'm originally from a farm in West Virginia, so when the movie started and it talked about her going to school in West Virginia, that, that had a little more meaning for me maybe than some. How is it? that people perceive each of us when we walk in a room. Well, I will say things are a lot different now than they were in the 1950s and 60s. But I'll also tell you that in aerospace engineering, today in 2017, if I walk in a room and people don't know me, they tend to require that I prove myself more because I'm female. It's still the case today. The problem is not gone. Now, I can speak from experience in that respect. I suppose in terms of uh, racial minority, I can't really speak from personal experience, but I think the same thing happens. So take care that when you see people walk into a room, when you interact with them, that you breathe deeply and work very hard to get past any tendency that you might have to complain or even have that reaction in the back of your mind that says this person should behave or think a certain way because of gender or race, because these are not accurate thoughts. What is accurate is that people have minds that have different preferences, and when you follow your preferences, when you follow your dreams, as this movie shows, you can do whatever you want, as long as you work really hard at it. And that's really where things start. So why do I put these quotes up here? Well, the first one, uh, I think uh, uh, there's no need to read them. The actors and cinematographers did so much better than my puny PowerPoint slide could ever do. The first one really gets at this concept of denial. Right? Most people don't think consciously that they have any bias. In fact, they'll argue that they don't. Right? The second one, it's a matter of what you want to do given what you're thinking and what your mind is really capable of doing. It's not about how you look. And I guess the third one is about that as well. The fourth one, I think, is more about aerospace and less about the social aspects of the movie. We're engaged in this somewhat of a race today. In fact, I think uh, there's another SpaceX flight that's going to happen pretty soon. Where we go is a little bit less driven by one agency saying this is what we're going to do, and more by companies and people not just in the United States, but around the world, saying, we want to explore. How do we do that? So it's an exciting time in aerospace as well. So I wanted to put up some more people that are pretty important in terms of what they've accomplished over their careers. And I tried to put some uh, kind of a broad spectrum of people. On the upper left, we have uh, Peggy Whitson. She's a NASA astronaut who very recently became the person to have spent the most days in space. 
well, the person who's a, a NASA astronaut. So in the center, the top, we have Charles Bolden, who has done a little bit of everything. You guys may have heard him speak uh, as the NASA administrator that was there until not too long ago. He also was an astronaut and a naval test pilot. So he pretty much did all of the fun things that one might do at NASA and maybe paid the price as the administrator, which may not be quite as much fun. On the bottom left, we have two people. How many of you have ever heard of Barbara Liskoff or Fran Allen? Anybody? Well, there's this award in computer science called the Turing Award, which is a, kind of a lifetime achievement award for doing really good stuff in computer science. And they, they are the two of the women who have won this award. You actually have to look kind of hard. The award has been around for a while, and there are a lot more men who have won this award. And I tried to look for it because I thought maybe I had missed something, but I couldn't find any uh, African-American winners of this award, so maybe next time. In the middle, Patty Wagstaff. Um, she's kind of uh, a random choice because she doesn't do either aerospace, astronaut, or computer science. But what she did do is fly really well. She's uh, the first female US national aerobatics championship champion, and uh, she took the notion of aerobatics from having separate categories for men and women and just mixing them all together, which was important because it used to be, well, the women are doing this and the men are doing that, and there was a lower expectation, but she changed that. And so now people just fly, and we watch them at air shows, and we have them do test pilot activities. And what we find is that there's not really a difference in capability. So then on the right are two uh, NASA astronauts. The one on the top right will be launching to ISS in 2018, Jeanette Epps. And on the bottom right, maybe this is a random choice, is Stephanie Wilson, who is an astronaut and also my classmate when I was an undergrad. So she's a good engineer good mathematician, and also a really good astronaut. She's flown three times in the space shuttle. It's not possible. I could have made a collage that had hundreds of people. But then you would be looking at them going, I wonder who's there. Right, so this is maybe the most important slide that I have. Look beyond the numbers through the math that doesn't exist yet. And you can replace the word math by computer algorithms, by solving any sort of problem you want. One of the things that I encounter, and educators are really struggling to modernize what happens in the classroom to meet the needs of people who have had phones and laptops since as maybe as long as you can remember, you've had access to a laptop or a computer. What I've noticed is that the homework assignment is something that people try to solve with examples. Well, to look beyond the numbers, you don't just care about plugging in some numbers to a formula and saying, look, I get 100% in an A. As you guys graduate from high school and go on to college, the real trick is to learn to think. That's why you bother to go to college. That's why you don't stop after high school and acknowledge that Wikipedia and Google Scholar and eventually IBM Watson uh, by the way, what they're planning to do next is to release a version of Watson that becomes a research assistant. Right, so it'll find good papers and pull out materials for people who are doing research. What you need to learn to do if you're pursuing STEM, science, technology, engineering, math type careers, is you need to think. You need to think about algorithms and computations from the computer science side. That doesn't mean you need to learn a language to program in. It means you need to think about fundamental concepts. Where does the data come from? Where does it go? How do we manage it? How do I do that efficiently? You need to think about the math. It's not just a matter of getting through Calc 1 through Calc 4 in college. It's a matter of understanding why calculus was developed. And if you have one derivation, whether it's for calculus, for the sake of calculus, or an application in engineering, 
How did people think when they first wrote that down? How do we get beyond just using what someone else did so that you have original and innovative thoughts that you can translate to solutions for problems that you want to solve? That's what you need to work toward. And don't give up. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about my research, which is involving safe and autonomous aircraft. This is not space, but they invited me here, so I'm going to talk about aircraft. And it is aerospace, where things change as you go from mechanical engineering and self-driving cars and all of those wonderful things into aerospace, is you worry about three dimensions, and you worry about going really fast, because that's how it's done. Right, so we have all kinds of airplanes. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide, things vary from the 787 and the A380 that you guys may have had the privilege of flying in, all the way down to the small drone that promises packaged pizza taco deliveries and all kinds of things in between. We also have fighters, and we have old planes like the yellow Piper Cub in the middle that have to share the airspace. Right, well, the reality is, There are more drones by over an order of magnitude already in 2017 than there are manned aircraft. Now, more doesn't mean they take up more of the space. More simply means that they're so cheap that you can go buy one or you can have a friend or family member buy you one and it doesn't take their life savings. How many of you have flown a drone before? Okay, finally some response. Well, so probably you've flown where you had the transmitter in your hand or a cell phone or something, and it was somewhere up in the sky near you. Maybe you had the fancy uh, first-person view camera, and you were looking at a TV screen and zooming along with the drone, projecting yourself into the drone. Well, that's all great. But right now, if you ask the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, what they'll say is that you need to fly within line of sight, meaning that you look directly with your eye up at that drone, and it's right there and furthermore, that you stay down low, under 400 feet. That's the standard way that model aircraft have been flown, and that's the way that it's okay for all of you to go out and fly today. Don't fly over other, bleh, don't fly over other people's heads, especially if they don't want you to. That's a general rule, and I think that goes without saying, but sometimes it's good to say it and remind people about that. Well, the reality is, technology is way ahead of what we understand, because we can have these things with GPS. We put waypoints in them and we set them off and they fly. So how do we mix those in cities with all the people and the cars on the road and with other airplanes in the sky? And how do we make sure everybody stays safe? Because we don't really want to be walking down the street, going to our favorite restaurant and be hit in the face with a drone, whether it kills us or not. So these are the kind of complicated questions that we're talking about now. And one of the things that goes without saying is the reason we have the quadcopter is because of software and sensors. Right? Humans cannot fly a quadcopter. You can't calculate in your head the four motor commands. You need a microprocessor and some sensors that tell you what the angles are of the vehicle. Going the next step, all aircraft today, except for the really old ones, have autopilots that allow either the pilot on board or the person at the remote control or ground station to look away and say go, and the plane can fly it between waypoints, which are GPS coordinates. And in most cases, even take off and land automatically. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that we can have the airplanes go wherever we want them to go without actually paying attention. Airplanes were able to do that about 20 years before self-driving cars were able to do that. Why is that? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what she said was that the uh, sensors are much cheaper 
and computers are much faster and smaller, and so they can now be put in cars. So that's true, and that also is what helped the small drones become so cheap so that you can use them to fly between waypoints as well. Um, but the other thing is the environment is simple, right? You have air around the vehicle. So you don't have to worry about animals and people crossing the road in front of you, uh, cliffs not to drive over, buildings and so on, stoplights. So there's a lot going on on the street that makes flying actually a lot simpler. Now the problem is, if two cars hit each other, especially on a freeway where they're going the same direction, you have a pretty decent chance of surviving. If two planes hit each other, there's much less chance that they're going to fall from the sky gracefully. So hitting things is a lot worse in a plane. So we have a lot of rules. Now where we are right now is that if everything is going well, whether it's a self-driving car or an autonomous airplane, they can drive or fly themselves. Where my research comes in is asking the question, what if things aren't going right? What if there are anomalies, which could be failures, bad weather, all kinds of different things, so that uh, the plane is not able to just peacefully fly between waypoints the way that you want it to? Well, in this case, if you have a person, hopefully they can step in and save the day, and then you can have everyone be happy, whether it's people on board of a manned aircraft or people on the ground that the unmanned aircraft might hit. Well, the reality is software and sensors can react a lot faster. There have been a lot of accidents over the last 20 years that have occurred in part because the pilot was not flying the plane, the autopilot was flying the plane, and then something went wrong. There would have been a lot of cues had the pilot been flying the plane, but they suddenly had to take over. Right, so think about driving a car, self-driving car, but it's level three or level four, meaning that it's not always, 100% of the time, going to drive itself. It could have situations where you need to drive for it. Now imagine that you're looking at your phone, because that would be okay in a car that drives itself, not okay in a car that you have to drive manually. And then suddenly something happens, and the car says, all right, your turn you're not going to be as ready to take over as if the car hadn't said, OK, your turn. It's going to take you longer to put down your cell phone, begin to look outside, grab the steering wheel, put your foot on the pedal, and actually do something that makes sense. Well, the same is true in aircraft. So we have the same challenge with keeping people engaged, whether it's a manned aircraft or unmanned aircraft that we have on the ground. So in a lot of cases, Pilot error really translates to the pilot was not paying attention because they didn't normally have to fly the plane. So we need to get to this level, especially if we have a lot of unmanned aircraft over cities all at the same time, where the plane can detect its own problems and react with software. So this is a research area that has gained increasing attention in parallel to the self-driving car community. And some of the things that I do is look at systems failures and how software can override when bad things are happening and keep things safe. So for example, in the case of this US Airways plane, which was pretty well known if you guys watched the Sully movie last fall and paid attention to when this happened a few years ago, I think it was 2009, uh, geese hit the engines of the plane and ended up in the Hudson River. First plot, one of only a couple. This is what path it flew. If you look over on the right-hand side, bottom right, you'll see LaGuardia runway takeoff climbing up, climbing up, near the very top altitude where you see the red square is where the geese hit the airplane. And at that point, thrust was greatly reduced. The engines were basically severely damaged. So then the plane came down into the Hudson River. Now, if you watch the movie, how many of you saw the movie Sully? All right, so a few of you did. Um, well, they kind of emphasize the fact that there's no way the flight crew could have been ready for that. Who would have ever thought that this commercial transport airplane on a regular day with good weather would have hit two geese to bring out the engines, or to bring down the engines all at the same time? Well, uh, they wouldn't, and so they didn't, and so they weren't really ready to turn around and go back to the runway. Well, if software had been there, it's actually a pretty simple problem to say what runways are within range of a plane that's basically gliding instead of using its engines. 
and what geometry gives us the solution, right? So a geometry meaning just turning and flying and then turning and landing, right? It's a problem that freshmen in college can easily solve, not even calculus. Well, if this software had been available on that plane, the plane could have landed back at LaGuardia. But time was an issue. Air traffic control would have needed to have recognized that there was a problem within 16 seconds, it turns out, and they would have needed to tell the other planes to get out of the way. If you listen to the cockpit voice recorder, it took much longer than 16 seconds for the air traffic controllers to even recognize there was a problem. So that needs to be done by data link, not by voice. And the second thing is, the software needs to be on the airplane ready to run. But the notion with this is it combines a set of uh, algorithmic logic, which turns into a decision-making tool from computer science, and combines that with path planning and guidance math from aerospace to allow software to take over and correct problems that otherwise would cause aircraft to crash. This particular case is takeoff. When you study anomalies, one of the things that people tell you, you can never, ever handle 100% of the, of the cases that you're going to encounter. Well, uh, actually, I feel like in aviation, we can come a lot closer than in most other fields, because we have accident data that has been collected and saved, and complete reports have been created for every aviation accident that's ever happened in the United States since people actually paid attention to accidents in the 1950s. So yes, we can make our software and our algorithms and our procedures handle every single accident that's ever happened. It's very rare to find a new type of accident. It's much more common to have accidents of the same type happen again and again. So that's what we're looking at. In this particular case, you see uh, an Emirates airline plane that overran the runway. Nobody died. But what happened here, if you look at the bottom uh, right box, the crew entered the wrong weight. Flight takeoff weight, FLTOW, was originally written as 262.9 tons, and they kind of fudged in the three later, which caused the plane to not use enough thrust to take off because of that error in data entry. So in this case, the plane damaged itself, but managed to go around and land, whereas with this kind of override automation software that my student and I worked on, the plane would recognize it wasn't going fast enough and stop before the end of the runway. So there's all kinds of cases. We did a runway overrun case. Uh, once we get a larger community acknowledging that we need these kinds of anomaly or emergency management um, algorithms into our airplanes, we have a very real chance of getting to the point where whether it's manned or unmanned aviation, the software, the sensors, the system all working together will make it such that it's incredibly rare to ever have an accident. Right now with commercial transport airplanes, it's rare enough. But the other airplanes, especially the drones, you run into somebody and they say, well, those just fall out of the sky. Well, they don't just fall out of the sky if you have the sensors, the software, and the systems to make them resilient. So that's what my group works on. In this case, um, I'm bringing up a couple of slides to end with to just kind of get you thinking about drones and what challenges they bring. In aerospace, one of the things that there's no shortage of is questions and challenges that don't have clear answers. Right now, the real question is, do we want drones or do we not want drones? Most of us want to fly them as hobbyists, and most of us want to have fun with them, but most of us don't want to be sitting in our backyards with somebody else's drone buzzing over top of us. That's a challenge, because that same drone that your friend or non-friend is flying over you and annoying you with is something that you also want to use. And you want your pizzas and your tacos and all of those things delivered to you, your Amazon Prime Air packages as well. So how do you reconcile that? That's an open challenge, which is still being addressed. Here at the University of Michigan, the uh, executive officers decided over a year ago that no one 
is allowed to fly drones over campus. Now, is that enforceable? I don't know. You guys shouldn't try it. But what did that cause? Well, I suppose one of the things that it caused is for the students who knew about that ban over campus to go to the local parks and pull out their drones. And no kidding, I've seen faculty be like, well, we can't fly over campus, so we're just going to go to the Ann Arbor parks. And I'm like, this is not a good idea. It's like trying to, and I like drones, trying to terminate all of the cockroaches from a house to, to you know, have pesticides, and then they go to another floor and infest that instead. So here we're taking all the drones away from the University of Michigan campus and putting them out to everybody else. So there are a lot of challenges, and uh, hopefully the technology as well as the policy challenges can be addressed. Suppose that you went to Detroit Metro and you're going to fly, let's say, to Europe for a fun trip over the summer. Maybe some of you are going there, maybe, maybe not. And uh, you got in the airplane. It's a brand new airplane. You hadn't seen this type before. And as you pass by what is normally the cockpit, you see that there's no people there. Certified airplane, maybe Delta Airlines, maybe somebody else. I'm not advertising any particular airline. I suppose I did, but that was not my intent. Would you get off the plane or would you fly, given that there was no human pilot, that it was fully autonomous? How many of you would sit down and comfortably fly to Europe? Okay. How many of you would turn around and get off the airplane and demand a refund? Okay, and I guess the ones who didn't raise your hand would sit down and fear for your life the whole way? Is that where we are? Okay. Yeah, you know, this is, this is amazing to me that if you, if you ask people about the planes, they will say that they want a human up front. But yet, most people are ready today to get in a car that's fully autonomous and ride around. For all of you who would either be afraid or turn around and walk off the plane, how many of you would have less fear of riding in a car on the freeway with no steering wheel? Okay. All right, any other comments about the movie? Obviously, this is a short presentation, and there's a lot of things out there to learn in terms of math, science, computer science, and also making sure that you are fair to everyone you meet in terms of uh, their characteristics. Yeah, it's in the back. Yeah, so, so I promised to repeat questions, but that was so long, I can't really repeat it. But I think the 10-second uh, the summary is that if you go from Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Detroit, Michigan, where integration has been pretty successful for a long time, and you go to a place that had a lot of segregation back in the 1950s and 1960s, that people were very different when they met each other, if they, um, you know, if they talked to each other at all, if you were in different groups. Another thing I wanted to mention, so Margot Shetterly, the author of the Hidden Figures book, came here to visit the University of Michigan a few months ago, and I was one of the faculty that had a chance to have a dinner with her, and 
one of the questions that was asked was, hey, you know, at the end of the movie, we see all of these women running this IBM mainframe computer, right? Wasn't that wonderful that we had this giant number of what were called computers that were transitioning to programmers that were doing really good pioneering work with this IBM mainframe at NASA Langley, if nowhere else? Well, uh, so we asked her what happened to them. And she said that basically over time, they moved or went away for various reasons and that they were largely replaced by men. And to some extent, the attitude was still, even after this whole room full of people was there, that the men were better at doing the hard calculations and the women were not. So that did not solve the problem. Don't think that at the end of the movie that suddenly gender and racial discrimination was gone. It was a nice way to end the movie, though. All right. Well, if you don't have any other statements or questions, thank you for coming and have a nice day.